Uh, we're home stretch. Uh, did a little juggling here. Very, very cool. Uh, hope you enjoyed uh, the cars that we had lined up for you to take a take a look at. Kick the tires. Uh, this, for me, of all the things I put together, was absolutely the most fun to 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 learn about myself. And and like you maybe have seen throughout the day, uh, in part, you know, I kind of. Like I said, I had a lot of buddies that were transportation researchers while I was at the Oak Ridge National Laboratory for about 40 years. And so I kind of had coffee with them, go to church with them, talk a lot about it. I was kind of comparable. We'd get lots of tours of dignitaries and stuff. I would talk about houses. They would talk about transportation. So I, I've got a little, little familiarity with the things that were happening. But I took this opportunity of really updating where things are at. And I've embedded it in this talk that I prepared specially for you today. So this has been titled, Who Will Win the Race to Fuel the Car of the Future? Um, a little interactive here. I'm going to tell you, I don't think anybody knows the answer to this question. So you be thinking, I'm just going to give you some facts. At the end, we'll do a straw poll and see, you know, see where this thing stands. But anyway, it is fascinating what's going on. And so I, I hope you enjoy this. Uh, this is an important race. This is a huge important race that is uh, unfolding before our eyes. And a lot of people are watching this race. Uh, a lot of people that may not necessarily be able to afford the, the Nissan and the Prius. Uh, they're gonna, it's cause this, but this is going to impact an awful lot of folks. There's a little equation. And this little equation is uh, all about the CO2 emissions. And the uh, contribution, you heard me say earlier that the stuff we do in a house is only 17%. Well, the stuff we do in a car is a good large fraction of the rest of that 83%. So this is an important discussion, an important race. And whoever runs this race is going to be a, a, a hero. This is a formula is about people. People don't use the word population anymore. But the co this, in fact, you know, as I grew up very much, if you don't know by now, I'm kind of revealing myself as somewhat of an environmentalist back from the 70s and still on it and doing as much as I can uh, in that whole front. But people don't talk about population control. That's, that's taboo. You, know, you want to have 15 kids, you're entitled to 15 kids. You know, but, but obviously, more people, the bigger that number. And then everybody needs services. And so let's just talk about you know, this is a service, a service being you know, miles uh, that we're going to have to travel, or mobility, call it whatever you wish. But the more we demand of a given service times the number of people, bigger the CO2 emissions. And then generally, although if we drive a uh, Escalada or a Tundra truck compared to the Leaf or the Prius, you know, this number is going to vary. But we have an energy expenditure per service. So the, the, the bigger this number, the bigger that CO2. And then, of course, and I showed you an equation. If I buy electric power, if I plug in that Nissan Leaf in Tennessee, how many, and what it was it, 168 grams of carbon uh, per kilowatt hour. You know, so that is an other important thing. So the higher this, this conversion factor, and it's going to be different if I burn propane or biodiesel. You know, but, so I, I contend that, uh, that, that you know, whatever ends up being a winner, needs to pay attention to this equation. And, and, and that is why I wanted to start this presentation. And by the way, if you don't know this, this presentation was the start of uh, Bill Gates, uh, just the, the slides that are free downloads from the Microsoft website. And, and this could be used, but it's very, very uh, powerful and very, very effective. The content you, I've changed, obviously, but the start of this, this is universal starting point for whatever you're talking about in the energy world. So uh, I did use the word. This is my word. It's not people. It's population. And we have a very diverse group of people that are all kind of feeding into that P. And the service that I want to focus on in this talk is the word mobility. Uh, a Ford executive used that word. He says, you know, what, what Americans are absolutely in love with is mobility. How they get it, you know, mobility, that freedom, that's, that's, that's the epitome of American and America and what we have. And, and so that's the word that they like uh, to, to, to use. So I've changed this from 
you know, miles or, or whatever and call my mobility per person per, per, per year. And then you've got the energy. So, you know, we saw two examples out there. And I will tell you that that same car, I, although mine's a 2010, that Prius that's in the parking lot, I, I, I've averaged about 55 miles per gallon. I've got about 30,000 miles on it. And I, I will get on the highway. And if I, if I drive just a little carefully by not accelerating, and, and the, the, the generally the cruise will not be the best way of driving cars like that. You generally drive like a truck, a little bit slower up hills, a little bit faster going down, and, and you can work that. And, and the gentleman in the parking lot was saying there's a couple of what they call hyper-milers. This is, this is crazy guys uh, that get in New York, get in the car, go all the way to California, and he was telling me they're getting 70 miles per gallon. And now sometimes they're over climbing the Rocky Mountains at 19 miles per hour, which is a little silly, but it shows, push come to shove, there's a technology, and, and by the way, I think this is a cure for the common type A person like me. All of a sudden, I'm chilling over, you know, reasonable, and I plan my trip so I'm not, you know, at 79 miles per mile, you know, arrive two seconds before my presentation. You know, I, so I, I think there's a lot of tangential uh, benefits to, you know, if you will, that Prius effect that, that, that is in this car. And we've already talked, the CO2 per, per unit of energy. And then there's no refuting. Now, there is some controversy here, but I'm going to try to skirt that. <clears throat> but there's nobody that's going to argue that CO2 doesn't equal temperature increase, doesn't equal negative effect. That's not the issue in the world. The issue is, does man contribute to this or not? And there are, believe it or not, some very intelligent people that don't believe there are. I am not of that, Vin, and I will tell you that scientists, the good ones that really have looked into all of this, there's no debate whatsoever on this climate change. But we're not gonna, gonna, gonna get into this and why we shouldn't be able to is kind of a shame. But there's very clear that as we are measured you know, from say 1855 to around now, we're seeing a pretty, and this, by the way, the, the, if I run this out a little bit longer, this is the hockey stick. This is the hockey stick that people talk about, that you know, this thing goes. And what, what people, um, and, 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 uh, and, and there'll be all kinds of correlations that people begin to tease in here to show the, the anthropological impact, which is man's impact on, on the, the, the heat. But th this is a, not a debated kind of number, this is all, you know, up to that point, very, very, very factual. 26 gigatons of CO2, whereas at the beginning of most of our lifetimes, we were at you know, seven. And this happened <laughs> That's an interesting observation. Big, big number. And this is, you know, and, and this is such a, Political hot table, hot, hot, hot button, and and but this is had been the kind of the logo, you know, for this whole issue. You know, the, it, who's going to be impacted most by this? You know, somebody told me if you want to sell anything, it has to be something huggable. I don't know if I'd really want to hug one of these guys, but it has to be something that people is warm and fuzzy. And and so the polar bear has been that poster child, if you will. And and as as I was preparing this, we passed another amazing milestone. And that is that we've now busted the all-time record on the amount of ice that's now up in, uh, uh, in Antarctica. And, and this is uh, a new, you know, the worst it had ever been was 2007. And many of us remember that was a very, very hot, hot, hot summer. Uh, we're at 158 already. And this is going to continue to melt until the end of September. So it is very, very likely we're about to make this guy even small. But so with that as a background, who is in the race? All right. What we're doing now is we're taking oil, and it's almost all about oil. There are Nissan Leafs. There's a few of them out there, which is not only oil. It's nuclear, coal, whatever the mix that you're plugging into. But that's obviously 
we're getting better and better at doing that, uh, that's got to be in contention. Tar sands. I was up in Canada two or three times the last couple of years, and boy, they're partying on up there. They're, they're doing well. <laughs> this pipeline that's coming out of Canada, they're doing real well. There's a lot of tar sands up there. And by the way, the, the, it's, it, you know, tar sands is kind of a lay, it, bit, it's bitumen sands. It's 12% uh, uh, higher CO2 than regular liquid oil. I can't put this into a pipeline straight up and pump it. It has to be heated. Additives have to be made. Its viscosity has to be a certain point, and then I can pump. It takes energy to do that. And so keep in mind that, yeah, this is here, but as we burn a gallon of gas, we're going to be doing 12% more CO2 than oil. Keep in mind my, my opening salvo, if you will, on that equation. Shale oil. CO2 emissions similar to lignite coal. Okay, this is the lowest energy content coal. So there's a lot of this, and then there's heavy oil. So Saudi Arabia can take this out of the ground for two bucks. As we begin to get it out of here, it's a whole lot more than two bucks. But the point is that we are not going to run out of carbon. This is, this, these sources are going to be with us for a long, long time. We're going to be spending more more money, more energy, but these are all very viable options, and it could be. We're going to get our vehicles lighter and safer and all these other things, and that the winner is going to be more of the same with the added capacity. And, and there is a wonderful, by wonderful, it's somewhat frightening, there's a guy in Italy, I, I get the Sunday New York Times, read it from cover to cover every year, I don't know why I do this, but you know, I don't have anything else to do on Sundays, I guess. But there is a guy in Italy that actually looked at the, 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 the oil fields all around the world, got these numbers, and he looked at right now the embedded investment, and it's enormous. And, and what the fear is, by, and it may not be a fear for many of us, is that all of this is going to come to market. And granted, what are you what are we talking about, dude? It's $5 a gallon. I just filled up. As this stuff begins to work itself into the pipeline, that's going to keep a cap on that price, and maybe, maybe, the bottom is going to fall out of a gallon of gasoline. And, and so, just so you hear, we're not talking about supply issues here. There's going to be plenty of supply, it's, but th this is a scenario that just turned my head sideways as far as viable possibility um, that could occur in the next you know, couple of years. Okay, the next candidate is we just sat in a Nissan LEAF, and it's pretty cool, the technology and its electricity. But what's the fuel behind it? You saw my equation. Uh, I showed it earlier. Uh, TVA is about 21% nukes, about 55% coal, uh, about 10% oh, natural gas, something, something like that. So that mixture is what actually goes into that need. So all of a sudden we got a nuclear powered coal power car. Now I like electric cars, but I really want to think about trying to green the grid, if you will, with uh, the wind that we talked about earlier, a little bit of the solar and things like that. So the whole, that's a kind of, if you will, category car number two. Number three is biofuels. Uh, I really, on the surface, want to like uh, biodiesel. And there's all these fun stories out there about going to all the greasy spoons in Cleveland and gathering up their cooking oil. Sim and this is really low-tech stuff. I happen to have a 200D Mercedes 1964 that, uh, you know, the conversion kit is a piece of cake. And if I had time, you know, going and doing this and, and actually burning on waste oil, that's a problem. You know, it's pretty fun. It's pretty neat. And when you do that, you can actually be reducing the carbon with that kind of biodiesel by like 85%. But how many French fries can we eat? Even though McDonald's has amazingly proven we can eat more than we ever dreamed we could, there's only so much of that. But when we go and we kind of look at biodiesel from the, the kind of corn and crops and things of that sort, now we're, we're talking about potentially uh, 
uh, more than fossil-based diesel CO2 emissions from what starts out as a very good, you know, kind of, if you will, bio-based. Then we have ethanol. Ethanol, there's two major sources, although Brazil has done this with sugarcane and done it pretty cool, pretty efficiently. Uh, here we've subsidized for a while corn. Uh, very, very, whoops, not a good idea. Co price of food went up. And then when we looked at actually the harvesting and the effort of energy that goes into harvest, we really didn't make any movement at all, and maybe even a little bit less, even, even more CO2 emissions when we took that route. Now, if you're from the Oak Ridge National Laboratory, <coughs> the big bat in this whole arena is cellulose. Potentially 85% reduction in CO2 emissions, but it is so contingent on how efficiently we can get the switchgrass, the leading candidate, if you will, for the cellulose, to the big processing facilities. And right here in Athens, I mean, many of you guys know and have heard the wonderful story, potentially. Some of the really neat stuff that is being worked on on the scientific level is actual manipulation, DNA level manipulation, so that that cellulose wall that needs to be broken can be done very, very easily at low energy levels. So we don't have to use you know, acids and really powerful things in our chemical processing to bust that available energy source in the cellulose. So there's neat stuff happening, but I will tell you that in this room when I would be, there would be a, a car guy, a, build, a buildings guy, that'd be me, and then there'd be a bio-based guy, and we'd be, say, briefing a senator or something like that. I would tell the story about Zero Energy House, the car guy would tell the story about the car, and the, and the, and the guy that's very familiar with the research on the, the cellulose to, 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 to ethanol would say, you know what, the New York Times articles and the, the political statements from people, it's a little aggressive. I really think we're 10 years away from really cracking this, this cellulose wall. It's a little bit more effort. So I just pose that as kind of an insight that I've gained. And, and, and there's a lot of good research that needs to be done. I think we're very hopeful that this will be the case. But a lot of the chits, if you will, from where I came from, uh, is money on, on this puppy right here. So you kind of say solar. Well, how, what do you mean solar? Well, we saw in that movie a silly little solar collector with a couple wheels on it. Um, we saw solar charging stations. Um, I mentioned um, that I bought a, off eBay a hacked uh, 208 Prius with a battery in it. I ran it every day to my lab where we had a collector. I plugged into the inverter, charged it with solar. At night, I'd go home, plug it into TVA power, but I'd only do it at night. TVA was very happy about that. It helped lower the, uh, helped flatten the load on, on the, the zero energy house. So it's conceivable we could see a little bit more of this. Okay, here is the latest entry to the race and scary possibility. Natural gas, we've talked about it, cheap. CO2 emissions, a, a very, very small. I showed you the equation. It was about 10% of coal. Um, uh, very, very low. Um, we talk about energy density. The, the uh, compressed natural gas storage offers very low weight uh, as opposed to uh, uh, you know, batteries comparing the Nissan. That, there's a lot of weight in that car. But compressed natural gas is, is pretty lightweight compared to all the heavy batteries that are in, in both of those cars really outside. Higher energy storage and lower cost, as well as faster refueling and recharging. It was very interesting. The fast charge over there, 28 minutes. Uh, but the electric utilities, I don't care where you are, that is going to cause an outrageous spike and they don't like that. They like the slow charge, the seven hour charge when you fully deplete that. But with CNG, you know, pull up just like a gas station if the gas stations existed and you could get that. So these are some important kind of introduction to our candidates here that are in the race. Uh, Jeff, how come uh, like in, in South America we didn't have the natural gas for years? They, you know, conversion took, you could either take the oil call and put regular gas in or the natural gas. They've been doing that for a long time, and yet we're still talking about it. You know, except for a boom chicken, like you were saying. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Is that a political thing or is that? Well, I, I, you'll see. I, I think I'm going to uh, convey this, but, but let me just tell you that, that natural gas is one of these things. When I first started in the, in the 70s in this whole arena, natural gas was such a precious commodity, it ought to be used for chemicals, for drugs, for, for high-quality industrial things. And that's what we shouldn't be doing it with such a low life thing like generating energy. There should be so many other alternatives. So there's been a variety of, if you will, kind of political viewpoints towards, mm -hmm. towards natural gas. And, and, and in, in this case, um, you know, this, this kind of phenomenon of this fracking um, has, you know, boom, all the environmentalists, oh, that's going to kill the, kill the, you know, we're going to contaminate water, you know. Well, right now, largely due part to the recession, but part to this fracking and parts which led to this drop in natural gas prices. Right now, we just hit CO2 emissions in the United States that have, the, have never been lower in the last 20 years. So on one side, you've got to feel good about that because you know, I introduced that very, 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 the driving equation that's helping us decide who's going to win this. So. And they're fracking, that's a fracking facility that's doing it? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and, and obviously, you know, as far as what means are available, that's the most economical thing to do right now. And you kind of think, oh, well, that's, that's CO2 and we don't even get any benefit from it. Yeah. Well, okay, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not trying to lay any opinions here yet on, on you. I'm just kind of trying to lay this thing out. And, and, and if you're not aware, uh, just last month, Congress invited smart people to come in and to weigh in on what we ought to do about the possibility of incentivizing our vehicles to be compressed natural gas. Sure. And, and it's a serious debate, a serious discussion. And, and if I'm reading the tea leaves, we're going to see it a lot being done in this area in the next couple. But this is not universally agreed that that's the best thing we should do. And I'm going to try to show you kind of some of the different si sides on this. And how far along are they with algae? Is it taking algae as a fuel source? I, I you know, I, working on it, but I mean. yeah, you know, I, I, Good point. And I was going to ask, what have I forgotten? And I, and I really, I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. Yeah. That is an interesting one. Maybe it's just a good way to get down. <laughs> well, no, I mean, no, I, you know, I, I mean, think we're all familiar. In fact, uh, uh, you know, there, there was some really good stuff going on. In fact, I'm from Wisconsin. Lake Mendota would just turn green every year. Yeah. And, see, and they would, they, there was a, a mechanical engineering professor that I worked on that compressed that. And it was great feedstock. Uh, but um, as far as conversion to fuel, but that's a good point. And I, I and I, and I'll tell you, I don't think it's out there in the leading kind of candidates from what I could gather in the last couple of minutes. But 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 it is you one. Never know when there's a bird shoot. You're right. You're right. And it. Can bird shoot up. And 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 I think that should be added to this list, and I need to bone up on that. Uh, prime movers is a, a word that I guess I don't know we used a lot. I mean, but that's. You kind of say, well, we talked about fuel, but you can't talk about fuel without the horse, without the, without the engine that you're going to use. And so it's kind of another way of looking at it, but, but that's important to understand which prime, where these guys stand. So the uh, internal combustion engine is making big headway. Uh, you see CAFE standard, that being the fleet mileage requirements, it, and, and they're getting higher and higher that the average fleet must be more and more efficient. Very quickly, you're going to go like to 31 miles per gallon. And, and a lot's been done. And that has been improvement in the engine, improvement in the fuel, improvement in the, the weight of the vehicle. Diesel. And I'm sorry if I repeated myself too many times, but that Passat with a TDI engine, it's, it, you can easily get 50 miles per gallon. This is in general 40%, the cycle for a diesel, about 40% more efficient than the internal combustion engine. Look to Europe, diesels are king, a lot cleaner, and very quiet, 
And, and that technology has been brought and is, uh, and is being assembled just, just south of here. No question, fuel cell, and I've been working on a fuel cell since 1978. Very, very impressive technology. And I will tell you, and I'm going to show you in a minute, all the majors are coming out in 2015 with a fuel cell powered vehicle. That means hydrogen. That is, you know, it's coming. Obviously, electric, LEAF is best available or, you know, very good example. You know, I put this gas turbine um, just because, well, why are gas turbines in jets? They're there because you get an incredible amount of power in very small. And there's these little micro turbines that uh, we always play with whenever we're brainstorming at, at, the, at the lab. As I looked into this, I didn't see a lot of serious effort in this front. And I think the hope for the fuel cell, which would use the same ga you know, gas, at least at first, would be, uh, would, so I don't know as if this is really leading. No, no. Yeah, J I mean, Jay Leno has one in his fleet, you know, and, and, and yeah, and I, I saw that, and it was kind of interesting. Yeah, it's, so it's not out of the question, but I, right now I just didn't see the buzz and the action on this. And then hybrid, great example. You're going to see that Prius. Sounds pretty impressive to me. That's coming out, uh, and, and it's available in some areas, I understand, where, um, and I, like I told you, I, I worked with this hack 2008 and really like the idea of the, electric at first, and, but for longer commutes, you still got the gas. The problem is going to be you're going to be carrying along another 100 pounds of weight for your long distance trips when you have that option. So for those that are going to be more in urban, more commuting mode, that will be more attractive than those that you know, have to do those uh, long, long hauls more frequently. I think an interesting sleeper here is what's going on in Volkswagen. And I don't know. They don't, but the, 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 the uh, the uh, Jetta is coming out. That's their hybrid that's in this Prius kind of category. And it's going to be gas. But with their TDI engine, I can't imagine that that's not far away. And hopefully others would come with that as well. So you get the high efficiency, you know, small diesel. And then in addition, you get the, the electric. So I, I think, you know, you know, kind of equivalent, if you will, miles per gallon pushing that that 90 to 100 that's on the window of the LEAF, I think is very, very doable without the head blowing, you know, can I get to the next cracker barrel? I just, you know, I, I, there's some real issues that, that are gonna have to be overcome with that one. Okay, so this was my lead into what we, uh, what we had uh, entertainment wise outside. Uh, i given my own personal testimony all day, all night. You can drive a 2010, 11, 12, Conventional straight up Prius, 56 miles per gallon, uh, plug-in hybrid. I had heard 15 mile range when that comes. Uh, the gentleman outside, Pete, I guess, told me 17. Uh, this was my research car. I got a whole dissertation on this. I got 103 miles per gallon. I hyper drove it about 16 miles one way and back. Back, I, I, I was off the interstate taking the back roads from my research house to my lab. And yes, at times I was going up Milton Hill Dam where there was never any traffic at 19 miles per, 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 uh, per, <laughs> per hour, which is silly, but you know, proving you could do it. I got almost 1,000 gallons on 9.5 gallons of gas you know, through that experiment. Did that in the winter. Um, so it, it showed me and kind of gave me a firsthand excitement over this being uh, an attractive uh, intermittent uh, leading candidate. The Nissan Leaf, we saw that, we heard it, uh, 100 mile range. The VW, I already talked about this, what is coming. I was kind of saddened that we couldn't get a Chevy Volt. Uh, that is a substantial car for anybody. Have you guys been in it or see, been up close to it? It is, it's a car. I mean, you, you're walking more up to a, you know, a Cadillac. It is, it is outside the category of what we saw there. It is a very, really just a, a, a cool machine. And the price is a, pretty hefty price. It's not in the, by the way, that Prius was about, uh, marked up at about uh, 26. All right, so we need, 
and Bill Gates calls this, this is the following. This is what we need. This is the miracle we need. We need zero CO2 at half the price of coal, which is generating power. So that's all he's asking. And, and more or less, if you've been following his philanthropy, you know, that is what is absolutely necessity. And so, you know, when, when you say zero, you know, what is, what's needed. And obviously, something very, and sometimes you don't think of this word, but very disruptive, something that really shakes stuff up is actually going to be going to be needed here. Uh, so, so the, the near-term innovations that are going on, the biofuels, the lightweight vehicles, the lab is all over. Carbon fiber this, carbon fiber that, same strength, third the weight, lots of good stuff going on, and that needs to continue. The advanced diesel and gasoline engines, uh, <coughs> this is, this is, uh, came to me from David Green. David Green, I go to church with, he's an ORNL corporate fellow, probably one of the smartest guys I know, and one of the big gifts that I felt when I was at the Oak Ridge National Laboratory, that I could be friends with people that were just mover shakers, major people. He was one of the gentlemen that was invited, there was five of them, to testify on the Hill as far as the idea of what are we going to do about, you know, incentivizing, or should we even incentivize compressed natural gas for our vehicles. And so he came down on the, the recognition that this diesel was really pretty attractive and, and, and was aware of what the Passat was doing and others and what was happening in Europe. And he ends up kind of saying, you know, keep an eye on this puppy because it's going to be, it's going to be competitive. Um, powerful lithium ion batteries, uh, you know, that's, that's clearly, there, and there's some huge sums of money. And if, if you will, politically, this is where we've been. With the Bush, it was fuel cells. It was, oh, let's not do anything near term. Let's throw it way out there. The, the Democrats came in, throw that out. Let's do electric cars. Let's do a more short term. Let's do batteries. And now, by the way, coming back, oh, wait, this, this, maybe we jumped horses too much. We ought to be doing parallel. We ought to be doing both the electric car and the hydrogen fuel cell car. And so, but, but, but both require uh, some breakthroughs in the, ion, ion, the lithium ion batteries. Ethanol, methanol, liquid uh, petroleum gas, compressed natural gas, battery electric, and hybrid cars. It, uh, that, you know, big something's got to happen with, with, with this whole range. And, and I will tell you, but I'm getting the sense that we're not, we're still a long ways away from it. Think hydrogen gas stations. Hydrogen is a very dangerous gas. We're going to distribute it through gas lines. I've seen it talked about, maybe, but leaks are more serious when it comes to hydrogen than, than, than natural gas. But we're talking most likely some infrastructure issues that have to come along. Now, I told you every once in a while I spend my time with the insides of the thinking in Walmart, and they were very seriously looking at they would be providing the infrastructure at every Walmart in the country. And you begin to stop and think about that one. How far do you got to go to the nearest Walmart? Just about everywhere. Not very far. And, and they kind of have, well, they got $10 billion a year to play with. Um, not a crazy, you know, so if somebody like that is convinced that this could happen, maybe it'll be faster. But, but do know that, that that infrastructure of delivery of that hydrogen is, is, a, is an issue. <clears throat> I'm going to do something kind of scary here. Uh, we can talk about this stuff all day, all night, and it is going to be expensive. And if indeed our good friends in S S Saudi Arabia, and by the way, Roosevelt signed, if, and, and many of you guys are well aware of this, we will protect you um, for oil agreement. Are you guys familiar with that? that, that okay. You know, so do know that it doesn't get raised a lot, but uh, my teacher son-in-law gave me this book called Zoom, and there was 200 issues at the, the school, the high school in, in Nashville that he teaches at. And, and it's, it's, it's a little dated, and I told you this is like, like uh, two years old, so you couldn't depend entirely, but what a nice kind of background piece in this whole area. 
And the title of this, and kind of inspired the title of this, The Global Race to the Fuel the Car of the Future. It came from my having not read, but having this book on my shelf that I converted this a little bit. Uh, but let me just go through something for you. And like I say, it, it only costs two bucks a, a, a barrel to get that out of the ground in the desert. It's very, very inexpensive. Apparently, there's 30,000 guards protecting this. And apparently, there is a study budget of $10 billion solely to protect this very precious global resource. Multiple rings of fencing. And here's where I make this leap. <laughs> and you know where I'm going. And, and, and then yet you see, as I'm writing here, a US empathy attack in the, and, a, and, 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 and a, a, a very loved dignitary in li li Libya, uh, Liberia, li Liberia, um, murdered you know, in this attack. And so you know, we, we have this incredible vulnerability that is guiding this thing. And, and, and at any time, you know, so if it's two, well, why is it $100 a barrel on the market if it takes two to process? So this is the boogeyman in all of this, you know, that, that we can be working on this and the business plan is going to roll this out and we're going to make tons of money because we got $100 uh, oil and, and boom, for five years, we can drop this down and just undercut it. So it's a, whoo, how do we get here from here? But just to kind of keep that in mind. People have done this. I, I haven't seen this movie. Have, any, have you guys? It's a movie about a bunch of terrorists going in a study port. And that's all it takes. Anyway, somebody, you know, it, it's always fun. Uh, you know, speaking of, consp this guy's big on conspiracies. <laughs> you know, he talks about Michael Moore's uh, stuff about the electric car and the, uh, you know, big, uh, big oil companies, you know, destroying it before it got out the first time. And, and you know, and, and so anyway, there's, I think there's an element of interest to this, not that you want to, you know, and believe these things, but, but they, they, they are kind of interesting. And Michael Moore's, a, despite what you, you know, his, con his, his controversialness, he, he does really put out some intriguing questions to, to at least uh, expose yourself to. Uh, not necessarily buy wholeheartedly, but he, he really wrestles with some interesting stuff. Uh, coal, obviously, CO2 problem, but manufacturing gasoline from non conventional petroleum is just as big. You know, so I've already made that point with those alternatives. And these are all things that are, you know, fueling this expected over supply of carbon here. Carbon tax, you know, I've been here. I've, I've always thought, you know, for goodness sake, let's do that. That makes so much sense. You know, if the gas falls below, say, three dollars a gallon, then tax so it always stays at three gallon. You know, anyway, in, somehow get some revenue so we can put it into these miracles that we need on the technology front. Not popular though. Uh, gas tax, you know, when this bottom falls off. You know, this has been suggested around. It's a, it's a it's a very attractive uh, possibility. Uh, what we really need, and and this is what I was I was hoping there'd be a, a whole lot of soldiers here in the trenches. You know, a grassroots movement uh, to end America's addiction to oil and tackle the global warming. And I was anticipating a couple of students in the class, and I'm hoping that several will be watching this at later times. But I mean, there is no more exciting <coughs> thing to dedicate a career to than, than this whole front. It's because of its importance. Uh, CAFE, uh, corporate average fuel economy, and this, uh, it's, it's one of the greatest things that have been done in the last four years is busting that, and because the automobile industry had been resisting and resisting and resisting. And then, you know, during the buyout, well, all of a sudden we can't resist. But I, I think this is very healthy and it's forcing innovation and getting us heading in the right direction. Uh, and it's kind of, I mean, again, you know, opening up offshore oil exploration, making little dent in our demand and large risk of the environment catastrophe. You know, this drill baby drill is, you know, we've been there before, and, 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 even if, and even as hot a potato as it is, and as popular as it's going to be because I feel the pain every time i got to fill my car up, it's just going to put a dent, and I go back to that $2 a gallon. You know, it's not, you know, we're fighting over this as if it's going to help, but it's very, it's, it's like very short-lived is, is the solution. I don't know what I was thinking here, but, you know, I, th I think we just got to watch out for 
when we see these political debates, are they really, w what's the undercurrent? I mean, I think utilities all come to, you know, they're pushing kilowatt hours. Big oil is pushing carbon. Uh, GM, Ford, ten, had been historically, I think they've softened somewhat uh, because of the, the situation that we were in through this recession, but they're pretty much dedicated and they understood that's where their money's made, defending that internal combustion engine. And so these are, you know, how real are these things? Uh, and there's been some really interesting leaders in these businesses that have, you know, despite the business, have jumped out. And, and I tell you, if you ever take this tour of VW, these guys, you know, this is a platinum, lead platinum automobile. It is cutting edge. The, the stuff that they've done and the whole ethic that they're bestowing on, on their, 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 their labor force is very commendable and very, very interesting. And, it, and, it, and, and, and there's been some, some people who unexpectedly have kind of said, you know, we're going we're gonna to venture into this area and, and have proved to be some pretty, but, but you kind of think BP, you know, this guy, you know, he, he's saying all the right stuff, doing a lot of the great stuff. And, and really, I, I, you know, after the Gulf uh, disaster uh, with that rig and the contamination and the oil spill and stuff, you know, this is a company that was really had made a great effort to kind of label themselves as sincere and believing and, you know, looking for the right kinds of directions to head. And, uh, and so there, there are these lone wolves out there that are in the right spot that are, that are, that are talking. Cost, cost, cost. We all know this. You know, I go back to my friend David David Green, and, and he is aware of the the the, the, new, the, the any ca the car and and that Chrysler made this, and that you know they talked about price, and in a very short time, that price of that fuel cell, and I know about all the complications of it, um, have have come down enormously, and so you know I we're, we're not too far away. Toyota, Honda, Mercedes. Uh, they're, they're all coming out with a hydrogen fuel cell vehicle. There's not going to be a lot of them. Uh, GM says they need another year, 2016. You're going to have this presentation, this slide. Click on Toyota, click on Honda, click. You, you can see what they got cooking. Very, 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 uh, very nice slide that you'll be able to, to check out. I'm not going to do it right now. I think fuel cells are technically very similar to batteries. Both contain three major parts. Two electrodes separated by a liquid called electrolyte. But while the batteries store electricity made elsewhere, fuel cell create their own from a variety of different substances, including hydrogen, which, uh, uh, you know, I would argue car makers are generally kind of favoring as evidenced by them rolling out something in uh, an ex you know, a notch above experimental levels very, very shortly. A study of not fuel cells in moving things, but in standalone in buildings. David Lee and a couple of other colleagues of mine at the lab did a study back in 2008 and in 2010. The red are prices today, 2010. The black were either real or predicted. And a substantial b below what was expected back in 2008. So the fuel cell from this cost basis is coming down, and this is, you know, very attractive that that kind of exercise has been done and shows that this, this fuel cell, and, and I will tell you, uh, I, 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 you know, in the 70s, I, I, I did a market penetration. I remember working very hard at this. I even slept there overnight, you know, trying to good, and the answer was, you know, for buildings, it wasn't there. And for cars, I think it's a whole other story. A lot has been done. We, but, but I'm telling you, people have been beaten on this fuel cell since the 70s. We're a long ways from the 70s. <coughs> Progress is being made, and we're getting smarter and better, and the necessity for these is getting more powerful. Uh, but, uh, it, but it's been a, a long haul. Well, I, you know, I didn't want to go there, but, you know, it's like another 30 years, you know, and, and I kind of wanted to, I used to say that, but I'm, but I will tell you, I'm not saying it today. I'm, I'm more hopeful on that fuel cell than I've been. But I would do the, that, you know, because it leads you to that discussion, you know. Yeah, right. <laughs> I, I concur. Uh, back to my friend, uh, you know, in, in, in Green's report, domestic and foreign fuel cell manufacturers have made remarkable progress, reducing the cost and improving the performance over the past three years. 
They face substantial barriers to market success. And like I say, this guy is not a, if you say something to him, he's always questioning you. He's always thinking. He's, he's not going to just go with the herd. He's, he, and he, he's respected for that. Further reducing costs via scale of economics, learning by experience, and for material handling applications. He, you know, we're, 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 we, we saw this learning by experience. And, and I've, my dad's taught me this too. For God's sakes, go out and build something. You know, it may not break, but build something. Stop talking about it. And uh, MIT is like that too. They, they, their philosophy is, you know, get enough going, so get your hands in there, get wet, get dirty, and you're going to learn from that. And there's been a lot of that. And that's, that's an encouraging first, first step. Uh, but but that's, that's kind of flattening out a little bit as we've gone on. Uh, at present, none of the fuel cell uh, uh, OEMs appear to be economically viable without public policy support. So this guy is a policy guy. He, he's not a gearhead. He's kind of looking at what's necessary. So for this to fly, you know, what he told congressmen under oath is that we're still going to need some, some support to get this off the ground. Containing or enhancing that support appears to be likely to lead to self-sustaining domestic industry before it's 2020. So he just feels that without that, um, it's, it's going to be a, a, even a longer haul. So I think he's there with these guys, and what do they have? They got our tax money to decide what to do with, and his arguments are this is not a bad place to go, if there's going to be any room. And here's what we've been dancing around all day. Look at in 2000 and in the middle of 2000, you know, we were at, at nine, uh, $10 a million BTUs today at four. This is where we are. Now, the, well, the EIA's predictions are we're going to kind of do this, but this is, this, is, this is somebody's guess, projection. But right now, we're bopping around here clearly at half of what we were just a couple, you know. So, so this, this kind of really addresses much of the discussion that we've had all day. And back to, you know, where our natural, you know, where, where things are coming from. Where, you know, this is the shale gas. Look at this in the future. You know, real natural gas, you know, drill a hole and get it out. Uh, you know, this is Alaska. This is lower 48. Uh, you know, it's coming down. Alternative growing. The tight gas, you know, that's the... Uh, you know, this is a little bit harder to extract, but pretty much staying the same. But the big kicker here is the fracking, in essence. Here's an interesting one. Uh, let's look at the fuel stations. Okay, methanol. That was popular buzz for a while. By the way, you know, it was a cold morning. You never start the thing. Uh, E85. Eh, you know. A lot of it out there, a lot of people don't even say, you know, big thing was the car, you know, met quotas, but they didn't even tell people that you could run on E85. Uh, 2,500. Uh, compressed natural gas, uh, 300, 1,200. We're actually less than we were back in the early 2000s. Propane, uh, 32, 26, pretty much the same. We'll look at electric, 18, uh, 188, 830. 2011, almost 3,400 electric stations. You know, the, the bling that he was talking about, this is the cracker barrels, lots and lots. 2012, probably be even a bigger number than 11. Liquefied natural gas, eh, not many. Biodiesel, we're seeing a you know, little growth here, but flattened out now, uh, largely due to the corn subsidies and such. Hydrogen. Uh, oh, oh, 56. This is what you need. This is the infrastructure. We got to go, you know, from 56 to one on every corner. But look at the electric. You know, yeah. So here's the big growth. You know, so if you were to say, you know, where are we in the race between hydrogen and electric, you'd say if it's talking about infrastructure, we're going a lot faster here right now than we are here.
Yeah, you know, by the way, the first group when I joined the lab at, uh, was working on the nuclear-powered uh, airplane, you know, that we go up for, and, and the big issue was safety, you know, what about a crash, you know, and, and, and that, that, that killed the program back, back then. So I'm sure it's back to the same kinds of health safety issues that have kind of spooked many people around that one. That's very good. I mean, that is that is a second candidate that I clearly left off the uh, left off the table. B by the way, are you saying there's pumps available? So I mean, we could add our individual houses that are affordable pumps that we could compress to the pressure. You know, like Home Depot, we heard what what what, what do you say about a hundred dollars for a Cadillac electric? Are we talking in that kind of range, a thousand dollars maybe? Uh, I don't know. I've never seen parking that I couldn't get into a lab and talk about. Yeah. Space. Yeah. Well, well, that's. That's that's very interesting. Great comment. Um, this is some additional sources, and let me tell you where David Green comes down on this, as opposed to where you did. He said, and, and everybody else that testified said, good idea, bring it on. David Green says, be very careful to incentivize this. We could really l use that natural gas to displace our coal, and that's the biggie, and that would do enormous good things. And he says, you know, industry's been suffering enormously, and maybe we get some industries back cranked up if we let them use the natural gas where they actually need the heat and we'll use many of the BTUs. So he was not, uh, came, did not come down and support that, that, that the government should intervene in the, the compressed natural gas. Uh, he, he, he said the, the subsidies are absolutely positively needed to get the fuel cell going, and he would like to see that, but, but felt danger with taking, and, and like I said, I, I'm just, I'm just going to tell you what his, his, his was, but that's, that's how he came, came down. Um, Uh, combine, combined cycle, combined cycle is not a, um, you know, that, that, that's the last thing that went online, yeah. you know, where they're yeah. using the gas turbine and the steam on the bottom end of it. You don't, you don't. Well, that's, that's pushing 48% efficient compared to, you know, 38 if you're just doing it in reverse. Okay, but I, I'm not there. So you're, okay. Yeah, good point. Uh, all right, so <coughs> that's all I had prepared. And uh, anybody else want to weigh in on, on, thank you, perfect, perfect. Anybody else uh, want to weigh in on? Well, the, the chart there on still unspoken for what they say, I know it's on the left there, so it went from 800 and some stations down to 400 in the middle of 2000. 